Hello, folks. Welcome to today's uh, today's meeting. We're glad that you could join us. My name is Jenna Tourget. I'll be the facilitator. You are at the Draft Programmatic Environmental Impact Statement DPEIS meeting. Uh, we're glad you're with us. We're going to wait just a moment as folks are joining. We have a few folks still entering the meeting, so we'll we'll give folks a moment to join. We're glad we are with us this afternoon. Okay, and with that, um, I'll have us head to the next slide. Uh, just to give some webinar instructions before we get started, many folks have been using Zoom meetings and Zoom webinars over the past few years. Um, as a reminder, we are in Zoom webinars, so you might not see as many features as you would in Zoom meeting. Um, there are a couple that I would that I would like to make note of. The first is that our chat button is for technical questions only. So if you need technical assistance, you can use the chat for that. Uh, we have closed captioning provided if you need that closed captioning. And as a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. Um, in a moment, I'll talk through the question and answer pod. So you should see that at the bottom of your screen as well. And during public comment, when we do have time for um, oral public comments, um, if you do raise your hand and we unmute you, you'll see the mute and unmute button as well. We can head to the next slide. Just a reminder again, if you need technical assistance, you can use the chat feature. Um, and if you're participating with us by phone, you can also raise your hand if you do need technical assistance. We do have a couple polls to get us started, and these polls are just a way for folks to um, see who else is on the meeting today and just understand the, uh, the breakdown of who has joined us. Um, before we launch the polls, I do want to note that at the top of your screen, depending on what Zoom uh, version of Zoom you do have, at the top left of your screen, you should see how many people have joined us today. We have about 20 attendees. Uh, and I will launch our first poll. And the poll is the question that you got when you registered for this meeting. And it's, what is your affiliation? So there's a few listed here, tribal indigenous, community-based organization, academia, government, non-government organization, business industry, press, or other. It looks like we have a few folks who are still responding to the poll. I'll give another moment as folks are giving their responses here. Okay, pretty good response rate. So we will share the results for folks to see who's joined us. And it looks like um, about 44% of folks joining are from business industry, followed by non-government organizations then government, community-based organizations, and then other. Our second poll for today is to give us an idea of who is um, planning on providing public comment. So uh, we, the question is, uh, do you plan on providing public comment today? And it will just give us a good, uh, an, a good idea of timing. Pause briefly as we wait for folks to respond. Okay, thank you so much, folks. Um, looks like we have a few that will be joining us for public comment at the end of, um, at the tail end of the, um, of the meeting today. So I'm gonna move us on to the next slide here. We can go to the next slide. I'll talk through um, 
our question and answer and public comment today. So we'll have two opportunities um, to uh, provide uh, questions and comments today. The first is question and answer. So um, this will be an opportunity for members of the public to ask clarifying questions regarding the process and BOEM staff will be able to provide those responses. So that Q&A pod is open now as you are hearing presentations and opening remarks today, um, if you do have questions related to the environmental scoping process, you can begin to enter those there. Uh, I do want to note that there might be questions that come up that aren't related to the environmental scoping process, and Boehm and Bessie will see those questions, they'll take note, but we won't be responding to those questions today. Following the question and answer, we'll have an opportunity for public comment. So this is a formal comment opportunity that's going to be part of the record. And so we're interested in gathering input on the scope of the PEIS and identifying potentially relevant information studies analysis to inform future decommissioning application decisions. So that public comment will take place after the Q&A. You can head to the next slide. We are here again today um, to provide information to you all on the draft PEIS, to answer questions related to it, to solicit your public comment on the draft PEIS, and then to talk through the next steps for the PEIS process. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Our agenda follows those objectives pretty closely. We are in the middle of the facilitator's welcome. We'll soon begin introductory remarks, have a presentation with an overview of BOEM decommissioning draft PEIS, a brief question and answer period, a time for oral public comments, and our closing and next steps. As we do the public comment, we ask that folks participate respectfully. Um, we'll speak in order. I'll mind the cue as the hands are raised when we get to that public comment opportunity. And as always, speak clearly into the mic and the, or your phone for others to hear you. And I'll ask this reminder when I ask you to mute or unmute to provide your name and affiliation when you speak. So now I'd like to um, open us up for our opening remarks. We'll have remarks from Rick Yard from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management from BOEM, Bruce Hessen from the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, Bessie, and Teresa Stevens from the Army Corps of Engineers. And we'll start today with Rick Yard. Thank you, Jenna, for uh, starting the meeting for us. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here, joining us at this meeting, this public uh, here meeting on the draft programmatic environment impact statement on decommissioning in Southern California. Um, I want to welcome you. I thank you for taking the time here today. Again, my name is Rick Yard. I'm the Regional Supervisor of the Office of Environment in the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Um, we uh, provide environmental services to BOEM, but also to BESI, the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement. Um, they're the action agency here. So this uh, decision but about decommissioning is theirs to make. You're gonna hear from them in a moment, uh, Bruce Hessen in particular. Um, but BOEM's uh, uh, supporting Bessie and preparing the environmental impact statement with our uh, subject matter expertise uh, in environmental matters here. Uh, what you are doing here today, I think, is to hear information about this programmatic document, uh, help understand it better, and to provide your comments on it. And uh, we appreciate you doing that. What we're doing here is to listen to that feedback that you have to help us to um, uh, add clarifications or expand on analysis in the document. The objective being to make it as uh, good as it can be to provide a solid foundation for the future analyses related to decommissioning in the Pacific. So again, thank you uh, for being here today, welcome. And I'll turn it back over to Jenna. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rick, uh, for those opening remarks. I'd like to now turn it over to Bruce Hessen from Bessie. So, Bruce? Yes, thanks, Jenna. Over to you. On behalf of the Department of Interior's Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, I'd like to welcome everyone to the first of two public meetings for the programmatic environment environmental impact statement for decommissioning activities in the Pacific region. 
My name is Bruce Heston. I'm the regional director for the Pacific region of the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, also referred to as BESI. The BESI Pacific region manages operational safety and enforcement oversight activities, as well as being the Environmental Enforcement Authority on the Outer Continental Shelf along offshore California, Oregon, Washington, and Hawaii. A little background about myself. I'm a 1983 graduate of Texas A&M University with a Bachelor of Science degree in Petroleum Engineering. And I've been a California registered professional engineer since 1997. I have 40 years of oil and gas experience in California and have been with Bessie since May of 2016. I served as a permitting section chief and the regional supervisor of field operations prior to being promoted to my current position in August of this year. The Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act and the implementation of regulations established decommissioning obligations to which a lessee must commit when they sign an agreement for an offshore lease. This includes a requirement that they apply for and obtain a permit for subsequent removal of their platforms. Thus, he enforces these obligations as well as other laws and regulations associated with the decommissioning of offshore oil and gas platforms and associated facilities in federal waters. Bessie initiated a programmatic EIS for the Pacific region decommissioning activities in Southern California in July of 2021. BOEM is assisting Bessie in the preparation of the environmental analysis with Bessie the decision maker for Pacific region decommissioning activities. As we prepare for anticipated offshore oil and gas decommissioning in the Pacific region, this environmental analysis will help provide critical information we need to better inform our decisions on future decommissioning applications. Your feedback is essential to ensure robust analysis based on sound science, public input, and the best available information. Bessie staff will consider all public comments received today and submitted in writing or through the Federal Register. I sincerely thank you for taking time today to attend this meeting and your input is very much appreciated. Again, thank you all. Great, thank you so much, Bruce, for those remarks. I'd now like to turn it over to Teresa Stevens from the Army Corps of Engineers. Teresa, over to you. Hi, thank you so much. Um, my name is Teresa Stevens, and I'm a US Army Corps of Engineers Senior Project Manager. On behalf of the Corps of Engineers, I'd like to welcome you to this public meeting. The Corps was invited to participate as a cooperating agency for this programmatic EIS, and we accepted this invitation to address NEPA compliance. While the Corps has no federal permit action for any particular decommissioning project at this time, the programmatic EIS will help inform the permit process for specific projects in the future. Federal permits qualify as federal actions, therefore the Corps must also comply with NEPA. Due to the nature and scope of activities that may occur in waters of the United States, the Corps has determined future decommissioning actions could result in significant impacts to the aquatic environment. Under our federal permit program, the Corps is responsible for regulating work and structures in waters of the United States, which may affect navigation and interstate commerce. Federal actions, such as Corps permit decisions, are subject to compliance with a variety of federal environmental laws in addition to NEPA. Consequently, the Corps has the responsibility to evaluate the environmental impacts that would be caused by proposed projects prior to making a permit decision. In meeting our regulatory responsibility, the Corps is neither a project proponent nor an opponent. In addition to evaluating the direct, indirect, and cumulative environmental impacts of proposed projects, the Corps must determine whether a proposed project is in the public interest. The public interest review requires core, the Corps objectively evaluate project benefits 
and balance them against a project's reasonably foreseeable detriments. The Corps' public interest determination requires a careful weighing of factors relevant to a particular project. No permit can be granted if the Corps finds a proposal is contrary to the public interest. The Corps would like to emphasize that we will accept and carefully consider all comments that are received today and they will be given full consideration as this EIS process continues. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa, uh, for those opening remarks. I'd now like to turn it over to Lynette Makua for an overview of the decommissioning draft PEIS. So Lynette, over to you. Okay, thanks, Jenna. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lynette Makua. I'm a NEPA coordinator with BOEM, working in the Office of the Environment, which is headed by Rickyard. So BOEM, in collaboration with Argonne National Laboratory, prepared the environmental analysis. This PEIS will provide foundation for efficient review of forthcoming decommissioning applications. Today, I will first provide some background of the area and infrastructure and then move into a high level overview of the PEIS. We can move to the next slide. Thank you. Shown here, we have the current lease areas and platforms. There are oil and gas platforms offshore near Orange, Los Angeles, Ventura, and Santa Barbara counties. There are no oil and gas platforms offshore Oregon, Washington, or Hawaii federal waters. The OCS, which you'll hear us say a lot, means outer continental shelf, and the jurisdiction, jurisdictional boundary is typically three to 200 nautical miles from the coastline. In this map, the California state platforms are in shallow water depths, which are shown in blue if you look closely. And the platforms in federal waters on the OCS are at depths of 150 feet, to nearly 1,200 feet, and those are shown in red here. I want to draw your attention to Platform Harmony, which is listed as number three. So if you look to the left of center of this map, it's in the Santa Barbara West platforms, and we'll use Harmony in an example in the next few slides going forward. Uh, next, please. Okay, here we have the top photo from around 1895, and then the same area of the coastline over a hundred years later. I wanted to show this to illustrate the production facilities life cycle. The life cycle of offshore production facilities can be simplified into four stages. The first is leasing and exploration, then construction, then production, which is what we're now in heading to decommissioning. I also wanted to take a moment here for background is how is the decommissioning different from state water versus federal waters. So while the general process is similar in state waters, the California Nat Natural Resources Agency, Natural Resources Agency is the lead agency consulting with the state resource agencies. And then operators with decommissioning projects in state waters must coordinate with federal entities that have authority in the state waters, which include the US Army Corps of Engineers and the US Coast Guard. All projects require coordination with local air pollution control districts and city planning departments. And if you don't have it, the link for our website is at the bottom there. So the next slide, please. Okay. Offshore California infrastructure was first installed in 1967, which is Platform Hogan. And the newest platform was installed in 1989 and is Platform Heritage. There are eight platforms, which are listed here at the bottom, that are in the beginning stages of decommissioning. And on the right, I wanted to take a moment to look at the simplified platform diagram. This shows conductors or wells, which is the same thing. You can see the line on the right pointing to those. And then I also wanted to point out top sides, which is bracketed on the left on the top, which is the portion of the facilities above sea level, essentially. And then another important part that we'll continue to talk about today is the jacket, which goes from the seafloor to the sea level. And you can see that bracketed there as well. Next slide, please. Thanks. OK, this is a picture of Platform Harmony. For those who have not been on or near a platform, this image can help emphasize what a huge amount of structure is being undertaken. 
if you note the blue arrow, it's pointing to a man walking and it really just looks like a dot. These are some of the deepest platforms, fixed platforms in the world. Harmony is 1,198 feet tall and located in the Santa Barbara West Channel. Harmony is operated by ExxonMobil Corporation and is the largest jacket in the Pacific OCS. Many of the heavy lift vessels and the large barges are not physically located in the US West Coast right now. As you could imagine from seeing this photo, specialized vessels are required for the removals and the partial removals. And this is factored into the PEIS and impact analysis. There is now high worldwide demand and less availability of the vessels necessary to conduct these huge lifts. Next slide, please. Thanks. Decommissioning is a very complex process. In 2016, Boehm, Bessie, and the California State Lands Commission chartered an interagency decommissioning working group. The working group includes federal, state, and local agencies and other authorities involved in permitting. The group's goal is to all be prepared for and coordinated when operators submit requests to decommission their facilities. So here on the right, you'll see a picture of the cover of the citizen's guide and the link is below. There's inside the citizen's guide for decommissioning is a matrix of responsibility. It's a really helpful resource. If you haven't looked at that yet, you can find out the approvals and actions that will be required for each of the platforms. And lastly, I wanted to cover that conductor removal has been covered under a separate analysis and these were done as EAs and that's already taking place in the Pacific. So you can find both of those EAs as appendices to this, which is appendix B and C. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, what is the difference between a programmatic EIS and a normal EIS? The National Environmental Policy Act of 1969 requires federal agencies to assess and document the environmental impacts and the alternatives to federal actions. So I want to make sure everyone's clear that this PEIS does not approve any decommissioning activities, as you can see on the bullet here. There are two types of environmental impact statements, the programmatic and site-specific or normal EIS. The programmatic analysis is a pathway for streamlining NEPA review. So in this case, while they're not identical, the 23 Pacific platforms share many commonalities, being geographic scope in the Pacific OCS, and then the federal action, which is decommissioning. This PEIS and the analysis does not require consultation or review under the ESA, the MMPA, NHPA, and so forth. So Bessie will review every individual decommissioning application as it is received and take into consideration the unique characteristics of each. The consultations, including essential fish habitat, will take place at the future EIS stage, the site specific. You may have also heard of tiering NEPA documents, and tiering allows environmental analyses for each site specific project to be conducted closer in time to the actual decommissioning phase, or in this case, as vessels become available. So the intent of tiering is to eliminate repetitive discussions and be able to focus on the actual issues that are ready for decision. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Okay, purpose and need. There's a purpose and need in every EA and EIS. And for this PEIS, it's necessary to analyze the environmental impacts and the safety risks of the decommissioning process and to inform agency decisions in order to minimize impacts and conflicts with other users of the OCS. Government agencies use accurate scientific analysis and focus on what is affected by the government action. The full purpose and need is in much more detail and can be found in chapter one. And then I also wanted to take a one second to point out this example of an upper jacket being removed in this photo on the right. Okay, next please. All right, chapter two of the PEIS walks through alternatives and the proposed action. In the numerical order of the alternatives, they can be succinctly referred to as complete removal, meaning everything comes off the seafloor, partial removal with artificial reefing, and then partial with 
without artificial reefing, and then lastly, our no action. So decommissioning under any of the three action alternatives, meaning the first three, the pre-severance activities would be include on-site mobilization, the support vessels and barges, preparation of the target platform for severance, and then the removal of the conductors. So there's three phases, pre-severance, severance, and disposal. Activities associated with the severance phase, they would vary between alternatives one through three. And also alternatives two and three will be similar in that they both include the complete topside removal and the conductor removal, but only partial removal of the platform jackets. So the pipelines and cables for both of those would be abandoned in place. We would expect abrasive and mechanical cutting as the likely removal method, which has been largely done, and explosives would be utilized as a contingency plan only and are not expected. Explosive severance is evaluated as three sub-alternatives for each of these action alternatives, and you can find that in the document. And then alternative four, not to leave that one out, is that following the lease termination, all the wells would have been permanently plugged and the pipelines would be decommissioned. So we can go to the next one. Thank you. For alternative two, the regulations are listed on the top right here, you can see. So this is the alternative for partial removal without an artificial reef. The associated pipelines would be abandoned in place rather than removed for alternative one, which is complete removal. Then alternative two provides a wide range of removal, meaning the facilities could be severed at 85 feet below the surface, which meets the Coast Guard requirements, or as far down as the seafloor or anywhere in between. Below the mudline structures would remain in place in this alternative, and it also would maintain some of the fish and invertebrate habitat that is present on the remaining platform jackets and along the undisturbed seafloor where the pipelines would be abandoned in place. Pipelines would be flushed of contaminants, filled with seawater, sealed, and then left in place on the seafloor with their ends buried. If there are inaccessible obstructions, including shell mounds, if there's any there, those would remain in place as well. And this is the same for alternative three, which is the artificial reef option. And then like alternative one, alternative two would also use onshore disposal of the platform topside and the upper jacket materials. So you could think of it as another way, alternative one would have the most onshore disposal and alternative three would have the least onshore disposal and then alternative two falls somewhere in between. All right, the next slide moving to alternative three. All right, our rigs to reef option. This, there's an extensive amount of research that has been conducted, much of it's funded by BOEM that has demonstrated the most productive habitat in the world maybe the underwater portions of these platforms that form artificial reefs in the Southern California Bight. This research motivated the state of California to pass legislation to enable consideration of a rigs to reefs option, which could preserve some of this productive habitat. Article two of Assembly Bill 2503 addresses partial removal of the offshore oil structures. And due to public demand, both partial removal alternatives were developed to consider other alternatives besides the default, which is alternative one. And Bohm and Bessie are still considering both of these at this time. Okay, next slide. Thanks. Okay, partial removal one more time. The partial removal means the jacket structure is severed to a permitted navigational depth of 85 feet or greater and placed on the seafloor next to the base of the remaining structure or it could be towed elsewhere for deployment. The 85 feet is determined by the regulating agency of navigation, which is the Coast Guard, but it's also required by the California Rigs to Reef Bill. So here in this diagram on the right, you can see a picture of what that would look like. And Bessie through its Rigs to Reef program, it may grant an exception from the requirement to remove the platform or other facility with certain conditions. So it would be provided that the structure complies with the National Artificial Reef Plan, the responsible state agencies acquire a permit from the US ACE and accepts title and liability for the structure that's placed in an artificial reef, and that it also satisfies the Coast Guard requirements I mentioned, and a few other things. But for more information, you can visit the section noted here at the top, 
if you want to read about that. Okay, next slide. Thank you. Okay, here on the left, you can see rock fishes on platform Gilda. And the photo on the right shows a diver next to conductors for scale. We've covered a lot of the physical area and the, a little bit of oil and drilling history in the state a few slides ago. This area is rich in diversity. It's a rich marine environment. In the summer, there's extensive upwelling here. And in addition to the natural habitats present in the intertidal and subtidal zones, the platforms present a unique artificial hard bottom habitat in contrasting with, in contrast, sorry, with the surrounding soft bottom habitats. The platform structure provides attachment sites for sessile invertebrates such as mussels, corals, bryozoans, and sponges, and it attracts a variety of mobile invertebrates and fish as well. We know that four sea turtle species occur here, and the area supports a diverse marine mammal community. Nearby cultural resources onshore include pre-contact and historic archaeological sites, built architectural resources, and also traditional cultural properties. So in addition to biological and cultural resources, there is socioeconomic information in Chapter 3, which includes population, employment, income statistics, housing, environmental justice, and more. OK, next slide. Thanks. Uh, for the resource impact, four impact levels were considered throughout this analysis. Those are negligible, minor, moderate, and major. For the three action alternatives, impacts are no more than moderate overall. The impacts on biological and physical resources were expected to be no more than minor, except for the possible moderate impacts on marine mammals and fishes with swim bladders, and temporary moderate impacts are expected on water quality and marine invertebrates and benthic habitat. To highlight what moderate impact is, is that when the viability of a resource is, when the viability of the resource is not threatened, although some of the impacts may be irreversible, the affected resource would recover completely if the mitigation were applied and once the stressor ceases, moderate impacts to the resource are unavoidable. And then switching gears to socioeconomic resources, minor is the most common impact. And that's also detailed more in chapter four. And for cultural resources, please understand that we're very early in the phase of consulting early and often. So we're in the process of conducting cultural resource studies with the intent to identify historic properties, including traditional cultural places and sacred sites. So these studies will be consulted on as appropriate through the section 106 process. Our preferred method of mitigation is avoidance and we'll continue to engage in consultations in order to best address the historic properties as we learn more. Okay, next slide. Okay, chapter through four details uh, the potential effects of decommissioning activities on socioeconomic systems and of course the natural and cultural resources. We identified the impact producing factors or IPFs, which could be considered stressors. And the factors accounted for include intensity, the geographic range, and the duration of potential effects associated with each specific activity. In order to perform evaluations of impacts, such as air emissions or socioeconomic impacts, those are measured only on an annual basis. So we used peak year activities from the largest platform which is platform harmony, which you saw in an earlier picture. And then up to eight platforms may be decommissioned in the next 10 years or about one year on average. So that's what we used. The IPFs to the resources or conditions, which you can find in chapter four, they include noise, air emission, turbidity and sedimentation, seafloor disturbance, lighting, vessel strikes, habitat loss, sanitary waste, wastewater, trash and debris, visual intrusions and space use conflicts. So here I noted the table, which is 4.1 to detail the IPF for natural resources in the alternatives. And if you're interested in the socio-cultural resources, that's the table right after it, which is the 4.1.2. And then as a reminder, the future NEPA analysis will focus on site-specific issues and effects related to the removal activities 
proposed in the individual applications. <clears throat> okay, next slide. Okay, for cumulative impacts. <clears throat> Under no action, most impacts are negligible when considering the current condition of and the stresses on the affected resource, as well as the resilience and sustainability of that particular resource. Overall, we do not expect noticeable cumulative effects on the resources potentially impacted by the proposed action when added to past, current, and foreseeable future impacts on these resources from other sources. So I have a list here at the bottom, but you're likely aware of future offshore wind development to meet various renewable energy goals. This is an extensive commercial and recreational fishing area in Southern California, as well as a lot of aquaculture in the coastal waters. And the levels of all three of those things are expected to continue and likely increase into the future. The Port of LA and the Port of Long Beach represent two of the largest ports in the United States, and they annually receive about 4,000 commercial cruise, commercial and cruise vessel arrivals, many of which come through the Santa Barbara Channel. And then other activities include military space launches and vessel testing, launches for civil and commercial space entities like SpaceX. Another thing related to cumulative impacts is the mitigation measures that we have throughout this document. Those are in section 4.1.2, and those are based on generally accepted good oil and gas practices. So I encourage you to turn to that. And uh, for example, the measures to reduce impact for turbidity and sedimentation, there's reducing impact for lighting effects, wastewater, and more uh, resources. Okay, next slide. Thanks. All right, BOEM, Bessie, and their predecessor agencies have funded several environmental and technical studies that inform the decommissioning offshore California. Since the late 1990s, nearly 50 studies have been conducted. And this study brochure, which you can see pictured here on the left, is available at the link listed at the top. It describes 42 completed studies and four studies that are currently underway. It's organized by discipline, including cultural, biological, archeological, shell mounds, and more. And more than half of the biological studies are biological and have produced important insights about the distribution, the habitat, behavior, and ecology of fish and other marine species, including species that use oil and gas platforms as their habitats. So this suite of studies will inform BOEM's assessment of potential impacts of decommissioning activity to the marine organisms and habitat. Next slide. Thank you. All right, to provide public comments, initially the date was November 28th, which has changed to December 12th right now. The agencies are still considering a few extension requests, but for now, December 12th, 859, Pacific time. There's three ways to comment, which is the Federal Register. You can send something in writing, or you can email Rick Yard, who you heard from earlier today. And we can go to the next slide. Okay, and that's it. My email is here if you have any questions. I hope that this overview helps you navigate the document and where you could best focus your time. But thank you for your attention, and thanks so much for being here today. Great, thank you so much, Lynette, for your presentation. Uh, we're gonna move into our Q&A. We can go to the next slide here and the one after this. Uh, just a quick differentiation between the Q&A. Uh, the the Q&A is for um, questions related to the environmental scoping process. And soon after um, the question and answer period, we'll have oral public comments as well. Um, so if you do have any questions related to uh, the environmental um, process, um, please add those to the Q&A now. We'll go one slide forward. The Q&A pod is at the bottom of your screen. As a note, you can enter anonymously or non-anonymously. Um, if you are a phone call-in user um, we, and you do have a question related to the environmental process, 
um, we can take that um, orally as well. You can dial star nine um, and we'll call on you to ask your question, um, but all of their questions will have through the Q&A box. So I'm going to wait a few moments to see if anyone does have a question about the environmental uh, scoping process. And I'll note as we're waiting for folks, if folks do have questions um, in the chat are a few links to what Lynette mentioned in her presentation. And so you can follow those through as well as um, head to the decommissioning activities website um, with BOEM to learn more about what was presented. Again, we're pausing to see if there's any questions and I do see one here. And so I'm gonna ask this question. Um, to Lynette and then um, see who the best person is to respond. Um, so can you explain the process for the eight platforms currently underway with decommissioning? Are they all being done under individual environmental assessments or will they be part of the PEIS process? I will uh, try to address that. Um, it's a great question. Thanks for asking that. Programmatic EIS is like this one, you know, as we described, set a foundation. I think that um, that was part of the question. Uh, so they provide a foundation for future analyses. This PEIS, as Lynette said, does not um, represent any current approvals. So nothing is approved at this point. This will just be um, a foundational analysis. As Bessie gets decommissioning applications in the future, there will be forthcoming. Uh, uh, environmental analyses associated with those applications specifically. The level of those reviews, whether they're EAs or EISs, will be determined at the time those applications are reviewed and, and uh, Bessie and Bohm make some judgment about the anticipated potential impacts. Great, thank you so much, Rick, for that response. And we're waiting to see if there's any other questions that are coming through the q and I'll just I'll just offer in addition to that. Um, I, I want to make sure I was responsive so to to the person who asked that if, if that didn't get to the heart of the question, please follow up. Thanks. Great. And I don't see a response, but we'll pause just a moment because we do have a few minutes for Q and a if needed to. Um, I think, Rick, the follow-up is what about the eight current platforms? So maybe just another note on um, what the process will cover. Sure. This document, and Lynette described as well, that there are eight platforms currently in early stages of decommissioning, and that's because for uh, uh, a number of potential reasons, they um, no longer have leases. They're expired. That means that they're not able to produce anymore. So they enter Bessie's decommissioning process. Um, and if the one of the questions embedded in there is about what's what's the current process, Boehm has supported Bessie in completing some EAs related to the early stages, which as Lynette described are those conductor removal operations. Um, uh, and that is preceding the actual later, larger decommissioning process. Hopefully I got it that time. Thank you, Rick. We'll wait a few more moments if there's any other questions that come in. Related to the PEIS. And there are a couple, there have been questions um, that are not related to the environmental scoping process. Uh, and so we do want to note that Boehm and Bessie are seeing those. We're taking note, um, but responding to questions related to the environmental scoping process. All right, I'll wait another moment because I always want folks to have a chance to ask the questions they have. And sometimes it takes me a moment to, to draft my question. So I'll wait another moment and then we'll move on to public comment. All right, I've seen another question come in. Um, is... Oof, I'm not, might pronounce this wrong. So someone from Boehm, correct me. Is there an SEO? Uh, oh, I'm so sorry. It's a, a, is there a separate process for associated onshore facilities? Okay. Is there a separate process for associated onshore facilities? And that might be a question for Bruce. 
Um, Bruce, is there a separate environmental um, impact or environmental scoping process for onshore facilities that would be related to decommissioning? Um, I, I don't have an answer to that question at this time, but I did make a note of it and okay. we'll uh, look into that. Great. Thank you so much, Bruce. And thanks for that question. Um, we'll make a note of that and um, for future conversations. All right. I want to thank folks for the questions that have been submitted so far related to the environmental impact process. I think um, just uh, get approval from Boehm and Bessie, we can move on to public comment, um, or we can pause for another moment or so to see if any other questions come in. There's nothing pending, Jenna. Jenna so. Nothing pending. I think we're good to go. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. Let's move on to our oral public comment opportunity today. Um, we're going to provide some instructions on the next slide here. Uh, we will, I have these process guidelines here. If you do have, if you would like to provide public comment, you can use the raise hand feature on the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can also dial star nine on your phone to indicate that you'd like to speak. Um, I'll call on folks in the order that they raise their hand um, and start first with um, people who indicated that they would like to provide comment when they registered. Um, speak clearly into your mic. Uh, you can provide your name and affiliation when you do speak. And please select the mute button to mute your audio when you're not speaking but also we'll take care of that for you as well. Uh, on the next slide here, I have some information on how we will um, cue the public comment, which I just mentioned, but I will note um, that public comment will be recorded um, and it will be three minutes. So please be respectful of everyone's time and opportunity to speak. Um, when we do call on folks uh, to raise your hand and to provide your public comment, We'll have that three minute timer on the screen just to guide the amount of time for folks. So we'll start with our first comment today. Uh, and we had Pete Stoffer uh, uh, register to provide comments. So Pete, we're gonna start with you. I see your hand raised. I'm going to allow you to speak if you can say your name and your affiliation, and then we'll start that three minutes. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? We hear you. Oh, great. Wonderful. Uh, I'm Pete Stoffer, Ocean Protection Manager for Surfrider Foundation. Uh, Surfrider is a grassroots organization that works to protect our coasts and ocean. And I'm providing comments on behalf of our 20 chapters in California, including those in Southern California. Uh, first, we greatly appreciate the work of the Department of Interior to develop the draft programmatic EIS. A robust EIS will provide a key foundation to successfully decommission the 23 platforms off California in a safe and environmentally sound manner. We're also encouraged to hear that the public comment period was extended. Uh, however, we urge you to extend the comment deadline for a full 45 days so the public will have sufficient time to review the document. Surfrider is currently working with partners to review the document, and we plan to provide written comments with more specific feedback. So at this stage, our feedback is general, but I would like to highlight a few things in oral testimony. Uh, one is that we're happy to see the agency analyze a full range of alternatives, including the full removal of platforms off California's coast. Uh, we're also pleased that the EIS addresses both temporary and long-term impacts and recognizes the differences between the two. Uh, we also wanna highlight some issues or questions we flagged in the draft EIS. Uh, first is that alternatives two, three, and four would allow industry to leave debris mounds and would, allow, would not allow for complete site cleanup. Uh, this represents a potential environmental hazard that should be addressed in the programmatic EIS. Uh, and second, we note that alternative two would allow the lower jacket 
to be left in place. And under federal regula regulations, this can only be done if it's part of a state artificial reef program. So that raises questions about uh, who maintains liability and management responsibility. Uh, we look forward to providing more specific input in writing before the comment deadline. Uh, and thank you again for your work on the CIS, which is fundamental to protecting California's environment and communities in the decades to come. Great, thank you, Pete, for your comment. Uh, I wanna call on our next person who's providing public com comment, Rachel. And if other folks are here to provide comment, you can raise your hand as well. So Rachel, over to you. We will um, invite you to allow you to talk here and you have three minutes. And if you can say your name and affiliation as well. Hi, uh, Rachel Condor, and I am a staff attorney at the Environmental Defense Center in Santa Barbara, and we represent the Surfrider Foundation in this matter. So I'm my comments will uh, somewhat overlap with Pete's, but um, I'll try not to be too repetitive. Um, thank you very much for the development of this EIS. Uh, the public has been waiting a long time for this, um, and it's it's long uh, overdue. So we're we're um, we were enthusiastically um, looking forward to um, being able to review this document. And we uh, likewise had asked for an extension of time of 45 days so that we can do an adequate analysis and consult with experts and then provide comments. So I just wanted to reiterate that request. Um, we we also identified um, some, some aspects of the EIS that we really appreciated. Um, looking at, the, we believe, the alternatives um, analysis uh, and impact um, to invasive species was particularly well done. And we wanted to complement the executive, the way this executive summary in the body of the EIS analyzed populations of fish um, with uh, localized versus regional population impacts, et cetera. Um, and we also really appreciated the analysis of the challenges and feasibility of some of uh, alt, uh, alternative reuses that have been proposed for the platform, such as renewable energy, energy given the age and deterioration of the platforms. Um, so following up on Pete's comments, um, we do have some suggestions and questions for additional analysis. Um, one of those would be the shell mounds, the, looking more closely at the environmental impacts of leaving infrastructure and debris mounds in place long term. Um, we're concerned because of the evidence of toxic contamination in the debris mounds left when Chevron removed the 4-H platforms offshore. And in addition, the EIS should analyze the potential risks of seismic events and tsunamis um, for a possible release of contaminants from shell mounds. Um, we also in terms of water quality, I have, I have a question that I'm hoping can be included regarding the pipeline flushing issue when the pipelines are decommissioned, um, either to be removed or to be left in place. How is that done so that it doesn't contaminate the marine environment um, with the stuff that's inside the pipelines? And then lastly, very quickly. Uh, we're looking and hoping for a more robust discussion of the likelihood of the availability of cleaner engine boats and barges and equipment to reduce the use of diesel fuel, both to reduce the pollution as well as the impact of the climate. And we'd also like to ask for the effect of the proposed mitigation measures of cleaner burning fuels um, to be analyzed. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Rachel, for your for your comment. Um, I want to pause and see if anyone else has uh, would like to provide oral public comment today. We'll wait a few moments. Okay, uh, Jeff, I'm going to unmute you here, and you have. Uh, if you unmute yourself on your end, uh, if you can say your name and your affiliation, you have three minutes. Hello, this is Jeff Mawson. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. Um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to comment and um, just wanted to touch base uh, preliminarily. 
Um, this is unscripted and I'm speaking extemporaneously. Um, I haven't had time to look at the draft EIS uh, nor familiarize myself with the depth and detail, but I intend to. Um, I'm a longtime commercial fisherman here in Santa Barbara. Specifically, I'm an urchin diver. So I probably have logged close to 20,000 miles underwater in the last 40 years of doing it, 38 years, excuse me. Um, I have dove the oil platforms uh, of, of recent, um, Houchin and Hogan harvesting mussels. And um, I've dove other platforms over the years um, uh, just to observe. So uh, my point in speaking to you now is um, to raise the issue and the possibility of utilizing the platforms, um, saving the jackets and maintaining some portion of the top sides uh, to utilize those, uh, those jackets for uh, aquaculture possibilities. Um, I represent, um, I'm a member of California Sea Urchin Divers Network, uh, the California Sea Urchin Commission, which is a state sanctioned organization, as well as Commercial Fishermen of Santa Barbara. And uh, in the Santa Barbara and Ventura area, there's probably 40 sea urchin vessels that are uniquely qualified and competent to be able to dive, harvest, and perform aquaculture activities on the platform legs. So what I'm getting at is uh, uh, obviously to espouse keeping uh, the jackets up to the surface and then some form of topside and then uh, growing abalone, scallops, um, uh, mussels on them for food for our community. So uh, I think uh, I'll be writing about that and obviously uh, talking to you uh, in the future, but I think that that should be part of uh, the equation here in utilizing that structure to provide food for our community. And then secondly, on top of that is, uh, I'm not hearing or seeing any discussion about the utilization of them for desalination, for any potential future technology that comes up with alternative energy sources. There's power lines, there's pipelines, there's a lot of infrastructure there available. And um, that may be utilized in the future given uh, we're in the throngs, it's 1130 in our climate uh, collapse. So um, I, I, I've read a lot about uh, the ability of those platforms to provide habitat. I've done harvesting off of them. I've seen the sea life, the seals, the birds that utilize those platforms as a refuge uh, when they can't come to shore. Um, and then also to be able to feed and, and survive. But uh, I'll, as I said, I know I'm wrapping up here, uh, I'll be communicating with you in writing with regard to my ideas. And then hopefully there's some consideration in the future with repurposing of the platforms and maintaining them as, an, uh, as a potential food source for our community, given uh, global warming, um, ocean acidification and climate collapse generally. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jeff, for your comment. I'll pause again to see if there's anyone else who would like to provide public comment. And just a reminder to our phone call-in users, if you would like to provide comment, you can also dial star nine to raise your hand and we can unmute you as well. Okay, so seeing uh, no hands raised here, uh, we will be actually on um, for the next little while, just if anyone does join and would like to provide comment. Um, but what we can do is um, move on to the next section to talk about how folks can um, provide some of the next steps here on um, how folks can provide comment outside of the verbal public comment. But Rick, I wanna turn it over to you for um, some closing remarks. Great, thank you, Jenna. Once again, thank you all for joining us today. We appreciate your participation. I'm glad that you're interested and um, glad that you're participating in the process. Uh, thank you for the commenters, uh, especially for um, telling us what's on your minds today. I heard all of you say that you're intending to submit written comments as well, which we appreciate. Um, uh, again, the objective being that we want to make this uh, analysis as strong as possible to provide a solid foundation for our future analyses uh, tiered from it uh, on the decommissioning applications. So looking forward to seeing all of your written comments. Those are our next steps. We're going to uh, close out this comment period in the coming weeks. 
and um, uh, evaluate everything that we've gotten in and work internally with our subject matter experts to uh, revise the document, to clarify, to add information that you've identified that is missing or that could be expanded um, and work towards releasing a final document. Um, and Lynette, what's our schedule? Do you wanna, I'm on. If, if we go to the next slide here. Okay. Well, the slide after that is here. <laughs> there we go. Oh, well, I think you're talking about the final, Rick. Yep. Okay, sure. So we are still considering the comment period request, but as is, our very rough estimate would be that we'll have the public final PEIS in May, June. My gut would lean towards June of 2023. And then we'd have a decision document, meaning a potential ROD in the late summer of 2023. Thank you, Lynette. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't want to try to do that myself because I probably would have been a month off. So thanks. <laughs> no worries. You see on this slide that it says the comment period is open right now until December 12th. I know that some of you have asked for longer comment periods, and I want to assure you that those uh, requests are still being considered by uh, Bessie. Um, and if the comment period is extended further than December 12th, watch our website and the Federal Register for more updates before December 12th, hopefully well before December 12th, so you will know about any potential further updates. But uh, right now, at least through December 12th, we are looking to get your comments. Again, thank you all for participating. We look forward to your comments. Uh, we uh, appreciate Bessie uh, joining in on this meeting as the action agency and providing their technical expertise. Thank you. And I also want to say thank you so much to the Corps of Engineers for being a participating or cooperating agency on this document and um, assisting with their expertise. They've been great partners in this. So thank you, Teresa and the Army Corps for being here as well. Um, and with that, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Vic. Um, as I mentioned before, we'll be staying on for um, the next little while if folks do join in would like to provide comment. Um, we appreciate your time here today. Um, I think we'll go off video for a bit. We'll, we'll be on if folks do um, wish to provide oral comment. Uh, thank you everyone for your time today. Um, and just reiterate what Rick mentioned about um, appreciation for, for your comment and for your questions and joining. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>